Hi everyone, I'm Simone and welcome to the first installation of a new series on my channel, tentatively called Docs and Thoughts, where I'm going to be giving a comprehensive review of everything notable in the preseason documentation, including the preseason designer notes, the season website, test server patches, and the top community issues and concerns blog. This video is going to be a hefty one, but will be chaptered for easier viewing. On mobile, check out the timestamps in the description. If you find this video useful, please consider supporting my channel by liking and subscribing, and of course, comment down below what your favorite feature coming is. Crystal Guard, the third season of Year 6, will introduce the 61st Operator to Rainbow Six Siege in September 2021. Please welcome Osa, the latest 2-speed, two 2-armor two attacking operator, hailing from Croatia. Born on April 29th, Anya Katarina Jankovic developed a passion for engineering and creativity, later using her skills to develop and maintain the research and development team in Nighthaven, Responsible for creating utilities such as Kali's Elite Uniform and Aruni's Prosthetics, Osa's engineering mastery is not to be underestimated. With her two Talon 8 shields, Osa will bring some defense to the offense, undoubtedly shaking strategies and creating new opportunities for the attack across the board. A Talon 8 shield is a transparent and bulletproof shield, comparable in size to the defense's deployable shields. Her shield can be carried in front of her with both hands for protection while intel gathering or while placing the shield, or it can be placed on floors or in window and door frames. If Osa can repel on a wall, the shield can be placed on the top of the frame as well. Osa can pick up and reposition her shields, and she cannot use a weapon while holding or deploying them. Attackers can still enter a window via repel when a shield is placed, but it will result in the destruction of the shield. Osa can repel into windows while holding her shield for additional protection. Shields are a source of long-standing frustration in the Siege community, but the Talonate shields are not without their counters. The shields are susceptible to explosive damage from nitro cell or impact grenades, and they are also susceptible to the shattered glass mechanic. If a deployed shield is hit with a melee attack, the transparent view is completely obstructed and the shield cannot be picked back up. If the shield is hit with a melee attack while in Osa's hands, she is susceptible to the guard break animation, where the shield is temporarily thrown to her side, leaving her more vulnerable to bullets. The shields can also be ejected by shooting a red button on the deploy side of the shield, be wary though, as the attack may use shattered glass and the ejection to their own benefit as well. Osa has two popular options for her primary weapon of choice. The first option is the 556XI, better known as Thermite's assault rifle. The second option is none other than Jackal's SMG, the PDW9. Osa's only secondary option is the PMM, the heavy hitting Russian sidearm. She can bring claymore or smoke grenades, depending on what role the player wants to capitalize on. Osa's Talon 8 shield and loadout puts her in the Intel Gatherer, Area Denial, and Anti-Roam roles according to Ubisoft, but her versatility will open many avenues of play. Personally, I'm most looking forward to the new plant spots that are opened up by the shield on attack, as well as the peace of mind that comes with being able to block runouts and line of sight for common defender peaks and plays. For example, when taking CCTV window on Clubhouse, Osa can place a shield on the construction window, eliminating a dangerous cross angle. Or, if you're a fan of repelling on hookah window on coastline, you can place a shield on the top of the mudroom window, preventing a very common defense peak from ending your play prematurely. Osa's shield and smoke grenades also put her in a perfect position for executing plants and protecting in the post plant. The introduction of Osa is also a monumental addition for Ubisoft's ongoing efforts to create a diverse and inclusive lineup of operators. With the arrival of Osa, Siege has its first trans individual, which is wonderful news. On top of a brand new operator, Crystal Guard is also introducing some landslide gadget reworks to some of my favorite operators in the game. Some of these changes will no doubt affect strategies and team compositions moving forward. Fuse is an operator I've always loved to play, but he hasn't been as well received in the community as a whole. The situational usefulness of his gadget and the detriments to being a 3 armor operator outweighed the possible benefits of his kit for many players. In Crystal Guard, however, Fuse will be receiving a huge buff to his Cluster Charge gadget. The Cluster Charge, of which he has four, can now be deployed on reinforced walls and on Mira's Black Mirror. Deploying a charge on a reinforcement, mirror, or castle armor panel will take three seconds longer to deploy, 
and will have an animation indicating the device is drilling through the surface, whereas on soft surfaces, the deployment is instantaneous. This gives the defense ample time to react. Once drilled, the extension tube is susceptible to damage, but at least one grenade will always deploy no matter how fast the defense reacts. The cluster charge is susceptible to electric damage, such as bandit tricking, and can be jammed by a signal disruptor, but only before detonation. When deployed on a mirror mirror, the deployment of the device will automatically shatter the mirror's glass, but will not eject the mirror. Fuse can deploy a cluster charge regardless if the mirror is shattered or not. The bounce of the grenades have also been reduced to aid in more consistent and predictable behavior, while also protecting the defense a little bit more given the charge's newfound versatility. This buff will allow Fuse to use his gadget in many more situations, sites, and setups, and will no doubt increase his usefulness as utility clear, area denial, and area control. As a trade-off to his newfound abilities, and due to Ace's ever-increasing pick rate, the AK-12's recoil was increased both vertically and horizontally. The AR will kick higher vertically and will pull to the right. As of the August 23rd test server patch, this recoil was updated from its original change to be less severe, however. Another operator positively affected in Crystal Guard is Twitch. Twitch will be losing access to her shock drone in the preparation phase and will instead be given access to a regular drone such that she can gather intel without risking her gadget. She will have access to both of her shock drones once the action phase begins. The shock drones have been hitting the gym during quarantine as they will now be able to jump like a regular drone. They've also ditched the taser technology and have borrowed one out of Maestro's book by switching to laser technology. In doing so, the shock drones now have infinite range, which will surely remove the frustration of those gadgets that were just a little too far away, as well as increase the usability of her gadget for gadget destruction, since Twitch may be able to keep her drone just that much safer. The laser upgrade has also brought back the 5 HP damage, up from 1 HP. But worry not for a resurgence of the bully meta, as the drone still has its bank and charge up system. The laser will destroy gadgets, but has lost its ability to disable them, so Twitch will no longer be able to open an evil eye or disable a banshee, but she will be able to destroy them if they're already open. The drone's bullet collision has also been doubled. This change brings Twitch's drones more in line with what players expect from other gadgets such as the Evil Eye or the Argus Cam, which is good news for the realm of consistency. I personally expect Twitch's pick rate to increase after this change, even though she was already a strong utility denial and intel gathering operator. I don't think this will be overpowered though, as it brings her more in line with current operators such as Flores, who has 4 explosive drones on top of 2 regular drones. Furthermore, with Mira as a continuously banned operator, this change may open up people to skipping the Mira ban and bringing the Twitch, as some smart drone placements may be able to eject canisters with little to no sacrifice on the drone's part. Mute, Electricity, and Mozzie still remain as useful counters against Twitch, as does keeping a watchful eye on your most prized gadgets. And, since she no longer has access to her preparation phase drone, a Twitch will have to sacrifice time executing to be able to clear utility during the action phase. Of all the reworked operators though, I believe IQ has received my favorite change. She can now use the smart ping feature while using her gadget. When IQ looks directly at an electronic device with her scanner, the gadget's identity is provided to IQ and she is able to ping it for her team to see. The ping, like Z-Ping, will be relevant to the gadget. For example, IQ will now be able to see a Valkyrie camera with her scanner and ping it for her teammates, which will identify the operator, if she's still unscanned, and reveal the location of the device. This also includes wearable gadgets such as phones, Vigil's ERC-7 cloak, and Pulse's heartbeat scanner. Gone are the days of IQ standing outside, squinting at her scanner, attempting to discern exactly what gadget she's looking at and where it is. This change will hopefully re-fortify IQ's position as a utility clearer, as she will be able to accurately relay the position of gadgets in the scenarios where she may be unable to deal with it herself. I personally really enjoy this change, and once it's implemented, I don't think anyone is going to remember the old way. Much like the reinforcement pool, I think it's such a great quality of life update that once you have it, you cannot imagine the old way of doing it. Mute is the only defender on this list to receive a gadget rework, as well as the only operator receiving a nerf of sorts. 
This rework is best described as a nerf to wall denial mute, but a buff to intel denial mute. Mute's an operator whose role was supposed to be primarily intel denial, but many players, myself included, use him as a one-to-one -one alternative to Bandit or Kaid, the true wall denial operators. Mute is an operator who's good at just about everything, site architecture, intel denial, gadget denial, wall denial, and fragging. Starting in Crystal Guard, however, the area of effect of his signal disruptors will be adjusted from a cylindrical shape to a sphere. Currently, the disruptors have a circular radius of 2.25 meters parallel to the ground and then go upward to the height of a reinforced wall. With this rework, the area of effect will be 2.25 meters radiated out from the center of the jammer in all directions. This means that while Mute can still partially deny a wall, the jammer will not provide full coverage, which provides openings for Hibana and Ace as well as Thermite if you can repel on the wall. Fuse and operators with hard breach secondaries may also exploit this weakness if they can repel. The rework also means that Mute can now deny gadgets and drones that are below his jammers, allowing him to place them in much more sneaky or advantageous positionings. Finally, the warning area of effect for drones will be a sphere with a 4.75 meter radius. All in all, I think this change to Mute was a long time coming and was very well executed. It allows him to do his intended job just as well, if not better, but also removes his ability to do it all. With this change, however, I do wonder if a new wall denial operator will be in the pipeline soon, given that this leaves us with Kaid and Bandit as our only full coverage wall deniers. Especially considering the fact that Kaid is often banned on certain maps due to his ability to hide his claws and electrify hatches. As is typical for the start of a season, some operators received more minor adjustments to their loadouts. Ace's AK-12 is affected by the same recoil change as Fuse. Zofia's M762 recoil has been readjusted from its recent nerf to be more manageable for players. The severity and inconsistency of the horizontal recoil to the left has been reduced. Glass's sniper rifle has an increased magazine count from 10 to 15 which will penalize players less for missed shots. Yana will be losing the 2x scope from the G36C and will be losing the 2.5x scope from the ARX200. These long-range scopes and her frag grenades allowed Yana to quickly pull ahead as a strong and versatile entry operator. These changes will balance her out to be more on par with other entries. Sledge will be losing access to the SMG11 secondary. A lot of people were really mad about this one, despite all of the content coming with this season. Sledge is my most played operator at 83 hours, and is one of my favorites. I knew a Sledge nerf had to come someday, and I think this nerf is perfectly acceptable, and honestly, I don't think it'll affect his pick rate in most cases. Sledge, like Mute, is a jack-of-all-trades operator. He has a primary weapon that hits like a, well, sledgehammer. He has frag grenades and ample soft destruction capabilities. He can frag, destroy utility, and hold powerful vertical positions. The only thing he really can't do is hard breach. The ability to engage in long range and close range fights equally in a single loadout had a very simple solution. Remove the SMG-11. Sledge maintains all of his former roles, but he loses one piece of overwhelming versatility. Change is hard to adjust to, I understand, especially for an operator that has gone unchanged for six years. But just because change is difficult doesn't mean that change is unwarranted or bad. And finally, to wrap up our list, Finca is trading out her hard breach secondary and is regaining access to frag grenades, which is something I was very pleased to see. Usually a season will contain an extensive rework on a single map, such as how Northstar brought with it the upheaval of the favela map. Crystal Guard, however, has brought with it three smaller reworks on three maps that needed adjustments, but not too much. These banks were Bank, Coastline, and Clubhouse. These maps have also received overhauled improvements to lighting and sound propagation. Bank is my favorite of these reworks, since Bank is a map that I currently ban on site due to its skylights, copious windows, runouts, and an inability to roam in a way you can in most maps. The most notable changes to Bank are as follows. An alley was added to connect the jewelry and alley access spawns from the outside, allowing for easier rotations whilst outside. 
Some skylights have been partially blocked to prevent difficult and powerful attacker positions. Notably, the square skylight can no longer be used to hold janitor hall. And the marble skylight can no longer be used to hold the elevator hall. To prevent runouts and spawn peaks, vehicles have been moved on the boulevard and the back alley terrace, and lines of sight have been adjusted. The arch windows in lobby have been closed to prevent easy sniping from the top of the parking garage. The ATM filing cabinets have been removed and replaced with a doorway. The lobby hatch has been moved from tellers to lobby and leads to the vault rather than vault entrance. The developers have made the elevator in the basement more roomy, so dropping feels less like a kill box and allows you more options, especially if a defense is getting more aggressive if they've heard you drop. And last but certainly not least, the metal bars have been removed and the square rails are destructible. Coastline received the second most changes in the trio of reworks, many of which are immense quality of life changes for the map. The largest of these changes include the following. My personal favorite change is that the kitchen service bomb site has been fully pulled back into stock, meaning that the attack can no longer plant in service door. They must pass the wall with the interior window. This removes the ease of frustrating smoke shield plants, which is a main reason why I always felt obligated to ban Montaigne on Coastline. The rooftop was another source of frustration for the defense, and I am happy to report that the lines of sight have been adjusted such that you can only see into certain spots of the hallway from the roof. Furthermore, the windows can be barricaded and some are closed entirely. Finally, VIP window has been replaced with a soft wall, accessible from DJ Balcony, and the attack can transition between DJ Balcony and the roof via repel or drop. The soft wall opens up many opportunities for extended defensive setups for the penthouse site, and also reduces the defense's ability to run out in the case of a hookah defense. Clubhouse is a beloved map arguably one of the most balanced in the game, and it's also received some great quality of life changes. When I learned that Clubhouse was on the slate to be reworked, I made a singular guess as to what they would change. As life would have it, I was right. The stock bar bomb site, the avoided plague of Clubhouse, has been adjusted to be a double bar bomb site, one bomb near stage and the other near the bar. Additionally, they've added a doorway behind the bar as an additional means of rotation. I look forward to this new viable interior bomb site, especially in Quick Match. The developers have also taken the liberty to adjust some pathways so that you can now traverse around the outside of the map 360 degrees without needing to repel. We've also seen some changes to the mannequins in the basement, as well as the pixel peek through the generator. The cache construction single wall has also had some experimental changes done to it, from becoming a hard wall to becoming a singular soft wall, rather than two skinny walls. There's no confirmation if these changes will reach the live build, but I'm personally rooting for the latter. Heyo, Simone here. If you're enjoying this video, please consider giving it a like or a comment, and if you're not subscribed already, consider subscribing for even more future content. Thank you. Back to the video. 
Player comfort and quality of life is a huge factor in the longevity and enjoyment of almost anything. In Crystal Guard, the developers have worked very hard to provide some excellent improvements that will hopefully leave players less frustrated and less prone to toxic behavior. A long-standing source of toxicity and infighting has been kill stealing. Specifically in the scenario where you've downed an enemy and while you reload or reposition, one of your teammates shoots and kills the downed enemy, thus securing that kill for their own stats. Sometimes it's unintentional, but either way it typically leaves people frustrated or angry, which can lead to further toxicity such as team killing. Crystal Guard will seek to dampen this source of frustration by adding a killed confirmed mechanic. When an operator who's in the DBNO state is killed, the person who put them in that state will get the scoreboard credit for that kill regardless of who committed the final damage. The kill feed will reflect the operator who dealt that final damage. This is a great change for team synergy, as now people may be more inclined to prioritize safety or strategy over padding their statistics, and will likely prevent many cases of thirsting kills. If another teammate is in a better position to secure your kill, Many more people will be more willing to let them now, rather than keeping it a secret in hopes that they can deliver the final blow. Frost is likely the biggest winner in this situation, as she will now get credit for operators killed while in her welcome mats, rather than having to sacrifice those for the greater good. Frost was an operator where I willingly gave up those kills for the betterment of the round, but I'm certainly happy that now my well-placed mats will be more rewarding than ever. Along with the adjusted DBNO scoring system, the injure notification a player receives when they down an operator has been removed. Players will now need to visually or audibly confirm or infer that an enemy is injured. This will require more game sense, confidence, and or droning to secure kills, rather than getting easy information that you otherwise never should have reasonably known, especially in the case of lucky wall bangs or trick shot grenades. The scoring notification will also make it harder for Frost, Cap Cans, and Fuses, or Frag Grenade Throwers, to know when their gadget has resulted in an injure unless it is seen or heard. Personally, it only took me a little time to get used to that crutch being removed, and it has increased my enjoyment overall, especially in cases where a revive is more possible, because the enemy didn't know they had downed me. This makes operators like Thunderbird more viable and the game feel more fair. A player is rewarded for paying attention. Some people are concerned that this is a detriment to new players and that it's contradictory to the reason they removed Withstand from Sophia. I disagree. The only people realistically affected by this change are players who have gotten used to it as an information crutch. New players will have never gotten used to having the notification and therefore will have no expectation of it being there. It will be as normal as breathing. I do understand if people are worried or concerned that they will have difficulty adjusting to this change, and surely, yes, sometimes you're going to mess up because you didn't realize someone was injured, but the game's integrity is undeniably improved by the removal of that unfair piece of information. As far as Sophia goes, I put it to you this way. No one's going to die because they didn't realize they downed someone, at least not directly. But people used to die all the time because they didn't realize that Sophia, separate from a gadget, had the ability to revive herself. And those people were normally new players. Another minor but very annoying form of toxicity is exploited by friendly fire damage of throwable devices. For example, when Legion throws a mine, Alibi throws a prisma, or an attacker throws a stun grenade, if that device directly hits the body of another operator, it will do 5 HP of damage. Some players use this as a form of toxicity wherein they'll repeatedly throw devices at their teammates to slowly take away their health and their patience. Other times, it's purely accidental during the bustle of preparation phase, or it's used to safely down and reset your teammates' health. Crystal Guard will remove the friendly fire associated with this type of damage. Explosive damage from these devices will still cause friendly fire damage though. For example, hitting someone with the brick of a nitro cell will not incur damage, but detonating the nitro will still cause damage to your team. The damage was not removed for enemies. I was actually disappointed in this since often a form of toxicity you'll see in secure area is operators using their throwables to kill a downed operator, which wastes time and is in general in bad taste, but I more often see it defender on defender, so I'm very happy to see this change in general. With the introduction of the North Star Seasonal Uniform, 
The community was disappointed to see another camouflage skin akin to Wind Bastion and Ember Rise. Skins that, while equipped, can render an operator nearly invisible against certain backgrounds. Coming in Crystal Guard, the developers have reintroduced what was originally claimed a bug on maps like Villa a few seasons ago. This bug is now a feature called rim lighting. Operators now have a dynamic, oily sheen over their body that makes them more easily distinguishable from their background, especially in darker areas of maps. While this feature can definitely be tweaked to be more helpful, it's a big step in the right direction and shaves off some of the advantage given by some of the more unfair skins. This feature can also be turned off in the options menu if you prefer the original look of the operators, but turning it off will only affect what you see in-game. On the topic of seeing, Crystal Guard is bringing with it improvements to both screen shake and flinch reduction. Screen shake's a visual indication that an explosion has occurred. The most severe case of screen shake is typically when Fuse deploys a cluster charge from above and continues to stand in that spot. The screen shake can be very severe and can affect a player's ability to aim and react. In the coming season, screen shake has been reduced across the board and has been removed entirely from the following gadgets. Ella's Grismont Mines, Zofia's Concussion Grenades, Echo's Yokai Bursts, and Nomad's Air Jabs. The screen shake will remain in some capacity for explosions because they relay important information similar to sound cues and maintain the danger or impact of explosions. Flinching has also been reduced across the board. Flinching occurs when a bullet makes impact to an operator's body. This can affect your ability to track or aim, since the body may move in unpredictable ways, and it can also be annoying for the person being shot. The bodily flinch has been reduced across the board to maintain a consistent movement for operators, whether or not they are currently taking damage. In a continuous effort to improve the game's consistency, ammunition count and magazine capacities have been altered across the board by weapon type. This will balance weapons and make for a more consistent expectation of how many bullets you have available. A big example of this is the disparity between the L85A2 assault rifle, with its 30 plus 1 magazine size, and 31 plus 210 ammo count, and the Type 89 assault rifle, with its 20 plus 1 magazine size, and 21 plus 160 ammo count. This leads to one assault rifle having to be extremely more reserved in their use of ammo, lest they run out when they need it. Habana mains everywhere learned long ago that the Type 89 is not to be used to open barricades, but sledge mains have not had to be so reserved. This change brings the L85 a bit closer to what you'd expect from the Type 89. The maximum ammunition count for assault rifles and primary SMGs have been reduced, the maximum ammunition count for secondary SMGs have been averaged to be consistent. The count for revolvers, DMRs, primary shotguns with spread, pistols, the ACS-12, and the TCSG-12 have all been increased, while the LMGs and Bosch G have remained relatively unchanged. The plus one bullet for fully reloading has also been added to all automatic weapons. These changes will hopefully result in a more consistent expectation from players and will require more thoughtful use of their bullets for many. In line with the weapon consistency, damage drop-off for each primary weapon type, except for shotguns with spread, have been adjusted to have consistent linear curves. Essentially, depending on the weapon type, you will have a consistent experience in the damage drop-off incurring at different distances. The damage drop-off for suppressors have also been unified at 15%, except for shotguns with spread. This will allow players to have a clear relationship between distance and damage based on the weapon type they choose, which will make the choice for equipping a suppressor a more educated and tactical one. In Ranked, I've led a very lucky path. As of recording, I've received MMR rollback a total of four times in my entire time playing Siege, and all four times were in North Star, and all four times were for positive rollback but many people weren't so lucky. I have a friend who's lost hundreds of MMR from rollback, most of which was likely due to winning against a cheater. Winning against a cheater should be something someone can be proud of, but currently you stand to lose your reward if that cheater is banned. In Crystal Guard, MMR rollback 3.0 is being introduced, which aims to improve player satisfaction. One large way they plan to do that is by letting players keep the MMR they gain by beating cheaters. 
Of course, you can still lose MMR if you win with a cheater on your team, whether or not you're in a squad with them. However, this is still a great change and will hopefully help boost morale, particularly for 5 stacks, who can control their end of the bargain. The new rollback system also indicated that it will have more consistent and restrictive period of rollback, ensuring that the most relevant matches are affected, although I'm not sure on the details of that claim. At any rate, any improvement to the frustrations involved in losing MMR that you feel you rightfully earned is welcome and appreciated. To wrap up the player comfort segment of this video, there are some smaller changes coming as well that don't have a huge effect on gameplay but still may be well received. First, uncommon alpha packs have been updated to a new teal color, distinguishing them more from common packs. Personally, I really enjoy the color they picked and they definitely feel less boring. The esports section of the shop will include a free esports pack that you can claim, as well as other new items. And there's been various updates and improvements to the UI and HUD, including cleaning up the post-action report, the ability to adjust the display area of the in-game HUD, and improving the information given in spectator mode. Beyond player comfort, developers spend a lot of time and energy ensuring that the game mechanics are as balanced as possible to maintain the overall health of the game. These changes may also help new players acclimate to the game and can also be related to player comfort. The first game health change coming in Crystal Guard is the reworked flash detection system. As they exist now, it can be difficult to use stun grenades effectively because their behavior is unpredictable and inconsistent. Some players may be fully flashed by an errant stun, while sometimes a player could be right in front of the stun and escape its effects almost entirely. The effects were also unpredictably scaled. Sometimes you may get half flashed, but still be able to see. The new system aims to be more consistent by using proximity as its primary calculation. Stun grenades will always fool white flash an operator, but the duration of the flash is what is dynamic based on four calculations, proximity to the detonation, orientation of the operator, the environment, and the angle of explosion. The closer you are to a stun, the longer you will be flashed. Players will still be rewarded for fast reaction time or situational awareness if they are able to look away or move away from the stun grenade before it detonates. This change will affect Ying's Candela's, Blitz's shield, and stun grenades. One of my personal favorite game health updates coming in Crystal Guard is the long-awaited HP armor system. Currently, operators can be 1 speed 3 armor, like Rook or Gridlock, 2 speed 2 armor, like Mute or Sledge, or 3 speed 1 armor like Kavera or Ash. Every operator has 100 HP, but the damage they take would be dynamically affected by their armor rating behind the scenes. For example, a gridlock currently would lose less health than an Ash even if they were damaged in an identical way. This caused confusion for players and uncertainty on what amount of damage one could tank, particularly since it can be difficult to remember what armor rating an operator is. In the new system, we're scrapping the behind-the-scenes multipliers. Armor rating will now be directly reflected as HP. Three armor operators will have 125, two armor operators will have 110, and one armor operators will have 100. Rook armor will grant an additional 20 HP to the operator wearing it. Due to an observation that many players who reach Platinum settle rather than working towards achieving Diamond, there's been a few adjustments made to the higher ranks. This is not the reworked ranking system, which will be coming in the future. The changes to the ranks are as follows. Plat 3 remains unchanged at 3200 MMR. Plat 2 has been lowered by 100 points to 3500. Plat 1 has been lowered by 200 points to 3800 MMR. Two brand new ranks have been added to the ranking system as well. Diamond 3 is at 4100 MMR, and Diamond 2 is at 4400. Diamond 1 was increased by 300 points and resides at a lofty 4700, which means that starting at Plat 3 and ending at Champion, each rank is separated by a consistent 300 MMR. Champion rank remains unchanged at 5000. As usual, Crystal Guard's seasonal weapon skin will also be available on launch in the shop as the holographic bundle. And it looks very clean and exciting so far. I'm excited to see its accompanying attachment skin and charm. Crystal Guard will also be introducing the first phase of Elite customization. 
On launch, players will be able to change the headgear of any operator while still keeping the Elite animation and card, which are now solely associated with the uniform portion of that Elite. If you want Unicorn Head Chachanka with his muscly shirtless body, you can have it. Future phases will let players fully customize their operator, but this will not be available at the launch of Crystal Guard. The developers were kind enough to key us in on even more future plans for the game by updating their Top Issues and Community Concerns blog. The most exciting and returning feature is that of the abandoned streamer mode. In their initial iterations, the developers were struggling with a number of technical debts that made creating a server-side streamer mode difficult, to the point of being perhaps impossible. It seems they've worked overtime to bring the community the mode they desired. Phase 1 of a server-side streamer mode is aimed to release in Season 4, which will allow users to scramble some of their information in-game. This will likely include the names of the players in the lobby. The blog says that they intend to release a detailed roadmap on their plans for stream modes specifically prior to the release of Season 4. This is a massive step towards bringing back the viability and fun in streaming Rainbow Six Siege, particularly for large content creators, but also for people who simply want to stream a fair game of rank to their viewers. Due to the implementation of streamer mode and MMR rollback, the work on preventative sanctions has been reprioritized. They expect this feature to come back to their focus in Year 7. Preventative sanctions are related to the reputation system, which is currently only running in the background collecting data on players, such as intentional team kills, gadget destruction, and reports. When it goes live, this is the system that will be able to punish consistently toxic players and reward those in good standing. While I do look forward to the reputation system, I do agree with their reprioritization, as rollback and stream sniping were both large detriments to the community's morale. Ubisoft, as usual, updated the community on its ongoing efforts to combat DDoS and mouse and keyboard on console. To protect players from DDoS attacks, wherein the lobby would be lagged out by malicious third parties, Ubisoft is increasing network protections in their servers, as well as improved detection systems which will let them better identify the sources of attacks and deal with them. Since mouse and keyboard use on console is done by using a third-party device, Ubisoft was in a difficult position of trying to solve a problem that's the responsibility of those device manufacturers or the console companies. In the blog, it seems that Ubisoft is shifting to a more accountable and proactive role as a part of the potential solution. While they didn't release any details for security reasons, they did let us know that a research and development team is currently working on ways to remove the advantage held by spoofers. How they will manage this is unknown, but I wish them the best. In the blog, we were also keyed into two possible game health changes coming in the future. The first will be improvements to squad management. Players will be able to change squad leader or kick players from their squad without having to recreate the entire squad. The second change will bring improvements to when the diffuser is dropped while playing the bomb mode. Currently, when the diffuser is dropped, it becomes the objective, and the attack loses sight of the bomb icons. This change will no longer hide the bomb icons, allowing for players to drop the diffuser without worrying that it'll disrupt or confuse their team. There was no indication when these changes are intended to be implemented, but I assume that they'll be aimed for Season 4 or Year 7. On that note, that's all the information that was provided to the community regarding the incoming season Crystal Guard. Crystal Guard will be releasing on September 7th. This season is so inundated with wonderful updates to player comfort, game health, operator reworks, and of course OSA, it's very difficult to pick a favorite. Personally, I'm most appreciative of confirmed kills and MMR rollback as far as game changes go. I'm looking forward to seeing how much OSA's introduction will shake the meta and looking forward to creating and trying new strategies. The operator reworks are also all very awesome. And I look forward to not banning bank on site as much anymore, or fearing the clubhouse bar stock site in quick match. Usually when a season is announced, there's one or two things that concern me, or at the very least warrant a closer observation. With Crystal Guard, I've not had that moment. I do wish Osa couldn't instantly break barricades without placing her shield down, but other than that, I wouldn't change or undo a single thing. If this video helped get you up to date with the marvelous changes coming in Season 3, please consider liking the video and subscribing to my channel. Less than half of my viewers are subscribed. I also stream on Twitch if live streaming is more your speed. Check out the links in the description below and thank you for watching. Bye!